Welcome to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast channel. In this episode, SOS author and Sheffield-based musician Nigel Humberstone talks to Ross Orton. Also based in Sheffield, Ross is a musician, songwriter, engineer and producer who first made an impact playing drums with Add N to X, Electro Trio, Fat Truckers and Jarvis Cocker. Since then, Ross has built up some impressive songwriting, production and mixing credits, including Arctic Monkeys 2013 album AM, the Mercury Prize nominated Arilla by MIA, The Fall, Toddler T, Roots Maneuver, The Kills, Tinchy Strider, Lady Hawk, Drenge and Working Men's Club. Thanks for chatting with us, Ross. From your background playing drums with the likes of Add N to X and the Fat Truckers, what influences and events brought about your move into recording? Well, I was I was mainly playing drums. Uh, I was doing a lot of drumming. Watch your ears, guys. And uh, it, it kind of stemmed from being in a lot of studios, doing a lot of drum recording, and obviously being on that side of, of, of the drum kit where you hear the acoustic drum sound all the time and the dynamics all the time. And every time I went and recorded in a studio, you know, the guy would be like, you know, recorded to tape back then, pre-Pro Tools days, and using compressors and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know, it just always found, sounded a bit, didn't sound brutal, didn't sound harsh, didn't sound, it didn't just didn't have life to it. It just, I don't know, I just, and I'd always complain to the to the poor engineer or producer, I'd be like, that's not how my drum sound. And he'd be like, well, yeah, when it when it's mixed, mate, you know, we'll, we'll get and it. And it always just sounded exactly the same. But I, I realized years later that that was his perception of how he wanted the drums to sound in the mix. To me, I just wanted my drums to sound like my drums. And then at that time, it was it was it was fast approaching the nineteen nineties, and DJs were becoming a thing, and electronic music was becoming a thing. I know that was part of Sheffield's heritage, really. But the way it was going was there wasn't a lot of breathing space for for live bands, and no one was going to gigs. So I, I actually ended up just not being in any bands anymore, and then kind of bumped into a couple of kids who had like some decks and and stuff, and then you know I started you know, I bought a pair of Technics and started DJing a little bit getting into kind of darker side of electronic music more like techno and craft work you know and leading on from that I, I, and just invested whatever little bits of money i had i just bought a sampler and a, a ms20 an old Allen and Heath desk just just had a few bits and bobs in my bedroom and just built this thing and just started concentrating on programming beats and putting little bits of synth on there and and then people started hearing what i was doing locally in sheffield people like parrot and started approaching me and obviously they could hear I had something, but I didn't know what I was doing at all, really. I just had no idea. And I think that was it, because I was outside that inner circle of Sheffield DJs of music. I wasn't making it for them, I was making it for myself. So I, I suppose it sounded a bit different and a bit fresh to them. So Parrot approached me and was like, you know, do you want to do some stuff? And I started working with him and he, he, he was amazing, you know. Got a lot, lot to thank him for, really, because he, he showed me how to just make a seven-minute piece of music with, like, four sounds, literally. It just never got boring. He was, like, the king of, like, minimal electronica in Sheffield at that time for me. So I was like, ah, oh, right, you know, this, this is kind of like a new avenue. I only had, like, one mic at the time. I think it was, like, a Bayer M380. I bought it off a, a guy who was retiring from uh, studio engineering to become a priest. Still got it, but it actually doesn't work. But I've got like two others, so I, I kind of collected them for a little bit because one of my favourite mics. Interestingly, one of Steve Albini's favourite mics, but I didn't know that at the time. But I used to use it on vocals, and I, I know they've made that mic for like bass, kick drum, and like brass applications. So, do you think the M380 became your favourite because it was the only mic you had? Anything that I put, it, I put in front of it. It just seemed to sound like it. I mean, there's no, there's no transformers in those things. They're like a Bayer headphone diaphragm that they're, that's inside there, and, and it's just a coil, kind of noise reduction unbooking coil or something in there. So that so you can actually plug it into a line amp, and it, it's got a serious amount of gain. So you don't actually need like a, a, a mic preamp, and if you just want it completely clean without the, the flavour or the colour of your preamps, you've got it with that thing. When did you realise that production was the direction that you wanted to take? Well, I... I never, I never used to call myself a producer because I, I started off doing a few remixes for labels and um, I had never actually sat and produced anything in my in my eyes. I mean, I would always create my own kick drum sounds with Sims and, and layer them up with like a 909 or an 880, but I'd always put something else in there and layer up my snare, a snare in the room, a snare drum in the room, and then put a bit of synth white noise on it and and then maybe like a sampled room shot or something in there and, and just layer up and then, and then resample everything. So I would be producing individual sounds um, but I'd, I, I never really saw it as production at the time. To me, a producer was someone who produced a piece of music. 
Um, so I would be getting sent a load of parts and I'd stick them all in the computer and just add a few of my sounds. And, and it, was, it was only until something came out with my name on that I decided it, it, I, you know, I could call myself a producer finally and that was the MIA record that I did with Steve Mackey. So it was, it was a tune called Galang that I'm very proud of. Um, so when that came out, I did, I did start getting a few, uh, a few more bits of work, uh, but obviously that was un, un, unrelated to bands. It was more like solo artists and vocalists and that kind of thing. Uh, but in the meantime, when I, as I was doing that, I started setting up my drum kit in my bedroom again and like putting me one microphone in and then I got an SM58 and then, you know, just dangling mics off things and, and resting it on top of wardrobe or something or, and just moving mics around and just trying to get a sound that would represent what was going on in my mind, I suppose. The setting up of McCall Sound Studios at the Crystal Ships Complex in Sheffield sounded like quite an undertaking for you. How did that come about? That was knowing Tim, who was the landlord there, did a couple of albums for his band, Bromhead's Jacket. There was, there was three rooms. There was the control room and the live room, and then there was another room that I was going to rent out to someone as like a kind of control room, uh, like a MIDI suite or something. But I just run out of money. Uh, and that, that just became a storeroom for all my drum kits and broken sims and bits and bobs. And it was an old steel factory, so it was all grim up there. Uh, and again, summer, boiling, winter freezing and uh, and it never looked like I was ever going to get yeah you know, I didn't have any wooden flooring down it was all like chipboard on top of rock floor uh, a few rugs cobbed around uh, bare walls it, it, you know the reverb times were immense um, so I started like cack handedly making my own uh, absorption panels without really knowing what I was doing and just like walking around, clapping my hands and hitting a snare drum, or things things that were bright and loud. I, I just kind of used those things, uh, just to, and then just put somewhere where I knew that I'd be a reflection of a ping, and that I'd deaden that. And, it, and in the end, I got I've got a pretty good drum sound in, in my room. It's pretty good. A lot of people say oh, it's a good drum sound that, and obviously because I made it to sound right for my drums, really. And then I just got I just got a phone call from Arctic Monkeys one day, just saying, "Really want to work with you? Can we come to your studio?" I was like, uh, yeah, if you want. And uh, obviously they all rocked up. I knew them a little bit anyway, it weren't like just out of the blue. But um, yeah, they rocked up to the studio and uh, we started working and we did, we did Are You Mine? Uh, we did Are You Mine there and I mixed it there as well. And Owl straight away was just like, I love this place. Oh, it's really good what you've got here, Ross. I went, what do you mean? I had no internet either. I didn't have, even, have, even have internet, I couldn't afford it. And he's like, because there's no distractions. And they could just turn up in the middle of what an industrial area of Sheffield. No one knew they were there, and you know they just had the phones off. And we just got on with the music, and it was great. Obviously, I have internet now, and it's a lot plusher. And I've got the roof filled in, and you know there's a proper wooden floor in there now. And you know we've got a kitchen. That that old room that was unfinished is now a nice kitchen, and we've got ISO booths in there. And but we've got we've, it's gone from three rooms to eight rooms down there. Uh, there's like a workshop in there and there's store rooms and we're just taking on another room that was was a it was an old substation room that's right that's right next to the studio that we've the landlord's giving me. So that's gonna be like a kind of lounge area and that kind of thing eventually. Which we need. Um I mean we're still using outside toilets down there. It's it's proper like bomb shelter. Yeah. Oh it's proper Sheffield, yeah. But like old bands that turn up, you know, they like I say, they go, oh, where's the toilet, mate? I'm like, oh, I'll take you, it's just round the corner. And they take them, and they go, and I'm like, sorry about that. It's always clean and stuff, but I'm like, oh, sorry about that. Like, it's all right, we've had worse, don't worry about it. And of course they have, you know, young bands, they, you know, they play toilets all over the place, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's homely, let's say that, it's cosy and homely. <laughs> Amongst your many credits as engineer, producer, drummer and mixer, you're also acknowledged as something of a clapper. How did that come about? Clapmaster. Yeah, I've got, I've got a good technique that is on uh, Do I Want to Know? We did that in um, Joshua Tree, Rancho de la Luna. And we, we did like the basic tracking for that. Uh, we were just demoing stuff and, and I had that idea, that bass line was just going round. And, and he just was, was not into the idea of like a full drum kit. He just thought it was just not going to work. And he was right. Um, he's a very smart kid. So I was like, right, okay. Well, I was like, you know, just like a stomping kick drum, you know? Boom, boom. I was like, what about some claps? Like, you know, he's like, what do you mean? I said, oh, well, you know. Anyway, we got, we spread ourselves all around and we were doing like flams on his legs and we were doing, you know, hitting his bellies and all sorts, all at the same time in different rooms. 
and that's the clap sound that we come out with. So yeah, I, I see, I do see myself as the clap master. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be on, that'll be on my tombstone. One thing this lad was good at were claps. He always had the clap going on. Yeah. Looking through your gear list, it would appear that whilst you're passionate about your outboard gear, the desk or your console isn't really the most important consideration. Well, that's that's the thing, you see. So uh, it, it's a uh, some Sony thing that I just use for monitoring through and use for headf headphone sends. I just use the auxiliaries for headphones or the channels for playback. For so I've got a monitor. My I use one of those here technologies uh, headphone monitoring systems that are brilliant. But I can assign my Pro Tools outputs. So I have like eight outputs coming to the desk that I can like you know I have like stereo drums, mono bass, whatever for, for the tracking purposes, and we can monitor in the control room. But and that's all I use it for. I've got I've got loads of, I've got loads of mic pre's. So I've got like I've got more than I've got in, inputs into me. Um, so I use Prism Titans, which are great. So I've got two of those like work clocked together. So there's like eight in, eight out on each one. But I've I've got about twenty odd mic pre's or like Neva like is and. I've got some APIs and all, all like, the, you know, the 11 slot kind of rack units I've got. I only use kind of Nevy stuff. I've got some new stuff in studio, which is actually clones, BAE stuff. I use a lot of BAE stuff, it's really good. But I just find it a little bit sluggish sometimes, the, the Neve thing. I think it's good for, for slower forms of music. I don't really do much of that, you see. It's, it's, I do a lot of punk and rock and electronic music. That seems to be that, the, the way I've gone over the years. Not because I just listen to that kind of music, that just seems to be the bands that approach me for the sound that I do. But I like the faster preamps, like the 312s and the 512s, the API stuff, I'm a big API. I fan really with the, the pads on the front are good and you know it works on on the higher source but I try not to pad as much as possible really because I have done some tests and I can hear the difference that tiny little bit of carbon there just does interfere and I've got my Silverface 1176 I think it's a I don't know it's one of the later ones that everybody hates um, when you go on all these forums like but I've used them I've, I've used them I've used all 1176s and some do sound a lot better than others and obviously they've been used a lot and there have been some of them have been in studios where people used to chain smoke and cob beer everywhere and yeah they said they've been serviced some of them but some of them are not, are not as good as others and there'll be like three in a rack that are meant to be from the same year but mine sounds great I love mine always use it on vocals always use it on kick drum always use it on bass DI control them transients going in super fast um, I've got my I've got one of my Prism Titans they're mega they're really really good awesome love that company everything just sounds so good uh, I've got my lunchbox here that's got two BAE 312 mic pre's oh it's got three actually three of them and an API 512 API 550B and one of those uh, what is it uh, what's it called Cape that's it and you can choose your transformers, you do different transformers, different op amps. Uh, you build them yourself, obviously. I think he might build them for you, but it's quite expensive. You know, I've got some of his mic pre's that are really nice. I think I've got about eight of them, built them all. Uh, really easy build as well, they're really simple. It's just like input, output, transformer and op amp. Do you have a favoured set of mics that you fall back on, say for recording drums? I do these days. I never used to. I, I used to be terrible for just trying all sorts of stuff. You know, one, one session I'd get an amazing drum sound with an average drummer, and then the next session it'd be a great drummer, and I'd not get as good a drum sound, because it'd just be me, like, you know, messing around with shit, like, trying out this old Altec mic that I just bought on eBay, like, getting it, you know, strapping it around his neck, or just doing, just doing all those things that you like to do when you're getting into producing stuff, and you're seeing the players as people who are just gonna give you this sound, and you can try out all your new tricks. But obviously, as I've, as I've kind of wandered aimlessly through that world of thin ice, you know, I've, I've arrived at a place where I've done my background checks, I've, I've read a lot about mics, I've tried a lot of mics, a lot of preamps, so I know what I'm going for, for for certain textures. And obviously, I've got quite a lot of different snares. I've got brass snares, steel snares, wood snares. I know how those kind of tones react with certain mics and certain preamps and, you know, and the speed of the drummer. I'll try and match that up to certain compressors and... and and, and preamps. So I'm interacting with the transient, I'm interacting with the player, I like, quite like that side of it. But I, like I say, I was saying earlier about like the Neve stuff, I'm not, not a big fan of sluggish equipment, so like optical compressors and things like that. I like them as like kind of finishing things on the, on because the, it's a style of music that I do, because it's fast. It's good like record a vocal through an 1176 and then put it through 
like we, we tube tech or something for the mix um, on a, you know on a slower attack and release times and stuff like that just to smooth it out even it out a bit but it, again it depends on the audio content really so I usually have like 13 inputs usually 12 13 mics so I'll have like high art snare top and bottom Tom's just top only I don't I don't mic top and bottom of Tom's at the same time I have done for Tom overdubs and it sounds amazing I use a lot of Bayer 201s but NC versions got about five or six of them well they're, they're hypercardioid as well so great on snare great on toms if we're talking rock drums here and punk drummers and auditing drummers they're, they're brilliant because they take a lot of spl uh, and there's a little bump in the low mid somewhere it might be like 250 to 500 area Very good right solid really good like thick solid turn on your snares and that but you've got a really nice i think there's a little rise at about 10k as well so they're nice nice on higher than snare bottom so i use those uh Coles 4038s, usually use a pair of them for overheads. Kick drum inside a kick, M380, always. But I'll, I'll, I'll move it around to find a good sound on it though in the, in the centre of the drum sometimes. Not, I never have it in the hole, never, never record in the hole because it's just that's where all the wind is and all the horrible stuff. And you just seem to be losing bottom end because it's all shooting out of that hole. A lot of people like to put a mic there and I'm like, I can understand why live guys do it, but to me, there's the, the, it's like being a drummer. So like your floor tom, for instance, or your rack tom. You hit it dead in the centre, and the air moves down, hits the other skin, the other skin, you know, you get your oscillations, you get your air moving up and down, up and down. It's all in the centre, it's not at the edge of the drum. So it's the same with like recording snare. If you, All the ring is at the end, it's, sorry, it's at the edge. That's where all the ring seems to B, that's where you put all your dampening is around the edge. So I always try and get my snare up and over a little bit, looking at the centre of the drum, but obviously the higher up you get, the, the, the lower tones seem to diminish a little bit, and then obviously you're getting more top end reflections off your eye outs and, and rack tom or whatever it is. But so I, I tend to move the kick drum mic into the middle, inside, so, but the best thing to do really, if you've got your skin with a hole in, and it'll always be to one side, like a left or a right side, is I'll loosen off all the uh, tuning rods, spin the skin round so it's the hole is at the bottom and put a weight or something inside i've got some like old dumbbell weights like five kilo weights or something and two kilos and they'll get through the hole if you can't take the skin off and then just put a weight on the cushion and it presses it down into the bottom of the drum and then you can get your mic in and the cable doesn't start hitting the pillow and then so get in at the bottom and then move your mic up a little bit and, have it, and you'll get it dead center so it'll be in between right right in front of the beat of them and then obviously with the figure of eight i'm getting the resonant head as well coming in at the back of the mic so that's the trick that i use uh, and compress at will with 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 whatever you like and let some of that front end through don't go crazy with that attack winding it all back so it's just like flattening out your sound because you'll have nothing left in the mix and get the release to go with however the guys play especially on those double beats somebody's like doo -doo 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 -doo. gotta have a fast compressor for that or it just evens out and you don't really feel the double pulse. It'll just sound like, you know what I mean? You'll lose it, lose that punch. And then on the outside, this is where I start getting phase problems now because of where I put me <laughs> fair M380. Um, and then outside, I'll put the 47. Uh, I've tried micing the beat aside, but uh, I just don't like it. I don't know. It just don't give me what I like. It just sounds a bit crappy to me. So I have the 47 outside there and then move that around until I map it. And then I've got a AEA R88 stereo ribbon that I'll have out in front of the kit. Again, placement is everything. But they're massive long ribbons in them. Very, very bright mic, actually. It's surprisingly bright for a ribbon. And then I have a, some people call it a smash mic, I suppose. Maybe I do. Um, a, a, a Bayer M260 ribbon ribbon mic. Is it dual ribbon, that one? And I have, I have that coming in over the top of the kick drum in between i mean most most drummers use one rack and a floor so i'll have it like in between underneath the ride symbol in between the rack and the floor facing the top of the snare if it goes too low you start getting a bit of or too far out you start getting a bit of like pedal squeak and a bit of like that crisp packety bottom snare thing um and obviously if it's too high you get too much ride symbol so i always try and talk work with the drummer to move his symbols and move stuff so the mic and that thing just sounds like pure 60s it's like that 60s mono drum kit sound and you can smash smash it without you want afterwards you know it's great but i never i never put anything on it on the way in 
try and keep the mics pretty clean. I might use a bit of EQ on toms on weighing, a little bit on snare, a little bit on kick, and just compression on my snare, really. Uh, sorry, on my kick drum, really. I don't use it on anything else. Uh, and then further back in the room, I'll use like a big ribbon, like an RCA or something, like quite far back in the room. So yeah, I'm kind of getting towards the edge of, before you start getting that flam, you know, that boundary effect thing. So I pull it in just to make sure I've got it, but it feels like part of the kit. And then I'll just have, I'll have like a hole mic, which could be anything. It could be a PZM, it could be a condenser mic set to Omni pattern. Depends on what I'm going for at the time. And I will compress that mic though. I like to compress that. And that's kind of my go-to sell, actually, like every time now. You've worked with a number of new bands. Is there a trick to producing whilst also helping people develop? Well, yeah, I've always, I've always thought it's about the music, not about the, you know, it's not, I don't want my thumbprints all over someone's record. I want it to sound great. And obviously I'm involved. I, I, I just see myself there as the guy who makes it happen, as in like stops them being distracted by all the flashing lights and the bells and the whistles and just get them concentrating on their parts and on the song. It's all about the song, really. So what do you find is needed to get a great performance? Make them a very good coffee and a nice cup of tea. And it, uh, don't leave anybody out is my thing. You know, you can have that one guy in the band who's he or she sat there at the back and they don't say anything for two days, not a thing. And then and you get to that point in the song where everybody's like, ah, oh, that's not really working. And, and, All right, well, I'll try a different mic. And, and you know, why don't, why don't we try a different, you know, why don't we try a baritone guitar instead of a bass or the, those kind of things? Use a synth instead of an organ or what, you know, and, and get a, a pog pedal on it or something. And you, you're trying, you'd be trying all these things. And then this person in the corner who sat there silent for two days ago. Uh, I've got an idea. Why don't we do this? And everybody just stops and looks at them, and it's like the best idea anybody's had in like two days. I've had a few of those moments where it's just taught me not to rule any either quiet person in the corner, the weirdo, get them involved as quickly as possible. I always find all, being all inclusive is is a great technique. Um, and I'm finding these days as well is there's bands getting signed up off, off putting like one song on or their little friends video up on YouTube and it's management companies and, and labels out there just scooping up all these young bands before they've even had a release and then they keep them working in, in studios and going in with producers and spending too much money really, if you ask me. Spending too much money on these young bands, sending them around, don't release anything for a good year or two, you know, developing the band. And the bands will turn up and literally wires hanging out of the guitar pedals, cables that don't work. Have you got a plectrum, mate? I've only got one drumstick. And it's literally this, you know, and, and they're paying good money to be in the studio with me. And I'm like, right, let's go out for a meal and a beer and get to know one another and then go back in the studio and go, right, OK. And let them choose the guitars they want to work with and let them choose the amp. And they'll be like, oh, can I try this, mate? Yeah. You haven't got a delay pedal, have you? Yeah, there's about four in that drawer there, mate. Oh, wicked. Oh, oh yeah. So we only need one, like, but we'll try them all. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can end up with pedal boards from here to Barnsley, you know, if you're not careful. When it comes to mixing, what are your preferences for monitoring and your choice of outboard? A pair of Auratones here, 70s Auratones, love them. I like mixing really quietly. A lot of people use them in mono, but I like them in stereo. I can check in mono with a plug-in if I want, but I just have them sit, sit, sit really close to so them, right at low levels, and I just get everything so bang on, like, you know, like nothing pokes out. It's, it's a bit like listening on laptop speakers these days, but obviously the newer laptops now, they're getting a lot more bass in the speakers, and once you've got your bass right, obviously, the less bass you've got to do with in a mix, the better. Your mids are free, all your upper mids are free. You can get everything nice and tight and you get your stereo balanced well and then switch back to your big speakers and just sit your bottom there nice and then go back to your little speakers and if it's nice and punchy, you know you've got it right. That's how I tend to work when I mix, really. I don't use them when I'm tracking. Oh, actually, apart from doing vocals, because you can tell that it's such a small bandwidth on them. You can really hear when a singer's out of tune. So I do all my comping, all my vocal comping on aura tones and tracking, I listen to them as well. So yeah, it, ch it changed the way I worked actually, going down into like little speakers. I used to mix in the box all the time and um, I was not getting my mixes right. I was getting a bit depressed thinking, well, I've produced this. I know everything that's in there. I've, I've got it right up until that mix point and now I'm mixing it and it's just falling a bit short and something's not gluing this stuff together. And then when I got into Pro Tools, we set up the outboard section of it so we can just use it as inserts and send out to outboard gear and come back in in real time and all that. And we set all that up through the mixer. And um, it started working really well. So I'd have like vocals going back, back out through a compressor in the mix and. And then I started investing in some stereo gear. I've got a nice uh, 
API 2500, love them things. So, I, so I'll have that on the mix bus, you know, I've got a nice stereo valve EQ. Some of it's clean, some of it's very good at saturating harmonically and all, and all that kind of thing. And and once I got into that world, I was like, wow, it just it's just a different it's just a different thing. And I've just recently invested in um, UAD stuff. Actually, I've just bought a four core satellite Thunderbolt thing, and they're really really good. But they still they still haven't got that analog thing. You know what I mean? They still haven't got that thing where sometimes you have to do a fonz, don't you, and whack the front panel and <laughs> for it to come back to life. And it's all that part of part of the vibe that I, that I like about analog gear. It sounds like your studio setups have been very drum centric. Is that a fair observation? Yeah, yeah, pr- yeah, pretty much. Because I always built when I when I got into making electronic music, I built it all around the drum sound as well. Do you know what I mean? I program up the drums first, and then I put synths on top. So I think it's just a I think it's just a carry on of that. Whatever's that's that's all that's ever been going around me. I, I very rarely play drums anymore. Kits always set up, and that's all I ever wanted. At one point, was a room with my drums in where I could go and play them at any time night or day, and no one would ever hear me, and no one would ever complain, because they were the most antisocial instrument on earth, really, a set of drums. Now I've got that space and the drums are set up, but bless it, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't take care of them in that way anymore, but I do give them a quick dust down when uh, a new band come in and put some new heads on for them and stuff like that, but music saved me, really. I mean, this is, this is not the first time music saved me. Thanks for chatting with us, Ross. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels.